Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 277th episode of the CodeCast Podcast. My name is Terry Fletcher. So today is the seventh day of February, so we're into the month, and it is heart month as well. And so I'm going to talk about a couple of things that have to do with that. But this is going to be kind of a mixed bag of information, not just coding information, but a couple of questions, some regulatory information, but also some breaking news information too, because even though I'm, you know, once a week, it's amazing how as soon as I record a podcast, then all of a sudden something comes out and I'm like, oh, shoot, I've got to wait a week to get it to my listeners. And I hate it when that happens. So uh, I just want to make sure that you have the information that you know where to search it out. And then if you need education on it, that you either go to my website and, you know, purchase a webinar or contact me and we can do a live one for your facility or your organization. But there's some things that really need to be addressed because as I'm sure you've heard by now, uh, about a week ago, the White House uh, office, OMB, announced that the public health emergency will end on May 11th. So the extension we were, um, sub, the, I should say, the extension we're in now uh, is supposed to be until April 11th. Some say April 16th, it's the 11th. And then we were waiting for a 60-day notice as promised by the HHS secretary uh, in February. But what happened instead is that the House Republican and said, this is enough. They actually tried to end it abruptly. I actually, again, many of you know I'm a conservative, but I think that would have been a mistake because everybody was still waiting to see if it was going to end or not end. And you still have to give organizations, physician practices, hospitals, you know, a, a good amount of time and a window to roll back everything that was there. And not everything rolls back. But remember, you're not in a CAA 151 day post PHE anymore. Now you're in the Omnibus Act, which is through 2024 for many covered services, when we talk about telehealth and things like that. But the one of the biggest impacts that not everybody has to deal with is the fact that um, Medicaid patients now will not have just extended coverage forever. They can sign up now for the Affordable Care Act uh, exchanges. And they have, I think that if you are Medicaid um not you're not actually approved, but you're not eligible, I should say. And you had insurance coverage. Now there's a, a loophole where you can continue your coverage through um, that avenue. But anyway, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things you, you need to know. One of the things that I would invite you to do, because I think you need a lot of this in writing, not just listening to my podcast or others, is you probably should sign up for a webinar. So I have a couple coming up. I want to put it right out there. In March, I have one with um, the NSCHBC, which is March 28th, and that is the Medicare first quarter update. March 21st, I also have a Medicare first quarter update with McVeigh seminars, and also then with NAMIS, which is the National Organization for Medical Auditors, um, on the 5th of April, I'm actually doing a, a co-presentation with, actually it's my cousin, <laughs> healthcare attorney uh, Brianna Santoli, and we're going to talk just about uh, telehealth. And we've got a, kind of a surprise situation going to happen during that uh, conference. So it's the NAMIS virtual conference on the 5th and 6th of April. So you have a lot of opportunities from education to figure out what's still available, what isn't, what extends through 2023, what goes through 2024. And there's a lot of things that people are making assumptions that things will be extended through 2024 that aren't accurate. So that are just not true. So make sure you do sign up for one of those um, educational platforms so that you can get everything you need in writing. But a couple of things I wanted to address because it seems to be my question of the week. And one of the big things has to do with chronic care management. And the reason I put this out here is because I've noticed when people are kind of um, fine tooth combing the De definition of chronic care management or CCM services, there is a spot in there that says that the staff, but again, clinical staff, it says they can perform activities such as collected uh, structured data, maintain and form updates for the care plan, manage care, um, and then provide 24-7 access care. 
document services, et cetera, and then su provide support services. You want to be clear on this because this is probably the, I would say the top three audited services in rack audits. Now it's focused on TPE. It's ridiculous because there's so much non-compliance on, critical, on uh, chronic care management. But I had a question, could you use the time coordinating uh, predeterminations, obtaining authorizations for referrals, uh, conducting phone prior authorizations, uh, trying to obtain additional information as to why something was declined from a billing perspective? No, this is not administrative. Chronic care management is clinical. And even though you may have clinical staff perform some of these activities, it's not appropriate to include any kind of administrative work on CCM uh, time thresholds for that month. I actually also had a one of my uh, bigger clients that asked me today, they said, well, we have some staff shortages for medical assistance. So we're calling back patients at night. We have a stack that we're calling back. We're um, calling patients just to let them know that their pharmacy um, requests were filled and just to give normal test results. Since our MAs are not available. Can we go ahead and charge telehealth? No. Remember, that is the cost of doing business. Unless it's a replacement for an office visit, it is not something that you can charge for. Patients have out of pockets for those. They have share of costs and the excessiveness of telehealth right now, even though I am a proponent of it in certain circumstances. Everybody needs to still understand that because I know it seems like I'm on the other side that says never do it. I'm not. I think it has its place. I think it's an extra delivery of medicine. And I think that it's a great extra to have for your practice. But when you start to overutilize it or to use it for services that are incidental to what you're doing and something that you've always done without getting reimbursed for it, I think it becomes an issue. Uh, CMS also weighed in on something. I saw it on LinkedIn and I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are killing me. So they weighed in on something saying that they're going to open up uh, physician to physician digital uh, consultation. So that is a code in the CPT book. But if you read that code, it's almost never qualified because you can't transfer the patient to that specialist um, is if it's PCP to specialist. Uh, the patient can have been seen in person by anybody. And so basically CMS is saying that a physician to physician digital converse, uh, consultation uh, can be paid for and you don't have to have a patient interface. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Who would want to take on that kind of risk where a primary care doctor in their testing calls a specialist and says, hey, I just uh, emailed you some testing on a patient and I want you to give me your professional opinion. How should we move forward uh, with their treatment? But they never saw the patient. Why would you want to do that? So there are times, especially if the patient is, um, you know, not in your state and you have authorization to do that and they can't travel there, but that's rare. I, I don't think that everybody should look at digital options as routine. And that's where it gets a little bit crazy. I'm still getting questions about doing portal visits, um, which they shouldn't be called portal visits. They should be called portal services where a patient has a question on some things within their uh, secured accessed portal on something that they were not clear on within their last in-person or audio and video, which is also, I would call in-person visit. And so they have questions on maybe a test result or path result, or maybe they, they have some questions on um, medicine interactions, but it shouldn't be a replacement for uh, any kind of um, visit. And I'm seeing that that's now being replaced as an actual visit, even though there's cu cumulative time threshold. So total time in a, in a seven day period. And a lot of times I'm not seeing the physicians complete this. And this is has to be completed by a physician or a mid-level provider. So there's a lot of information digitally that I think sometimes is um, starting to come to the forefront. And I, you don't want to treat patients like um, the fast food companies are treating their customers. I don't know if you've seen some of the new rollouts for McDonald's or uh, Taco Bell or anything like that. They're rolling them out now where there's no people. There's no people involved. It's all digital. It's all automated where you punch stuff in and it comes down in a little shoot and it's handed to you by kind of a robotic arm and there's no interaction. Let's not bring our medical services to that. That that would be a shame to me and very sad. And so we, we want to keep that personal touch into some of these things. Otherwise, 
I just think it's going to be a mess. And remember, we are now at the end of the PHE coming up here in, in 120 days. And this is important because um, that means that the understanding is patients want to get back to the office. They want to get back to in-person visits. And so it's just important to realize that this is where we're at now. We are at the endemic. Um, and yes, there, we're going to still see some blips in COVID. It doesn't mean it's gone. It means we're now learning to live with it. And we're going to see, obviously, flu season is here in January for, for many of us. So um, just keep some of these things in mind. Uh, and I just wanted to, I don't know, I'm, I know I'm kind of going on and on a little bit, but I just wanted to put in perspective digital versus in person and uh, just some of the regulatory options and published information that it seems like people are making assumptions by just reading titles and not fine tooth combing everything going through and looking at details. Also, I did put an article up on my website at terryfletcher.net that talks about the end of the PHE and also gives you some information as far as what is next. So um, take a look at that as well. I, ha I have a blog site up there. So moving on, I wanted to uh, talk to you about something I just read and I read it on one of my social media platforms. And okay, so if you don't know me personally, but you just know me through the podcast, I don't like stuff that to me is, I don't know, just seems silly or incidental. Um, what I mean by that is I think right now in our society, and I've been thinking this for a long time, people are so easily and I'm air quoting triggered by things that really really shouldn't trigger people, in my opinion. Again, that's all my opinion. You know, it's my podcast. So I put that out there. You know, just just, you know, thinking that somebody's saying something mean, because um, it just because you don't like it doesn't mean that it's mean. But in saying that, I was reading this uh, kind of I guess it was a comparison in violent language, especially through emails and how you talk to people. And I was like, Oh, my gosh, I think I do that. And this is something that will, I think, change a mindset a little bit. And I know it's not really healthcare or medical, but I just wanted to kind of uh, just give you a, a little bit of a maybe a side perspective on something I thought was interesting. So instead of saying, we're going to pull the trigger, say we're going to launch, uh, instead of saying, I'll take a stab at it, say I'll take a first pass at it. I like that one. Uh, did we jump the gun or did we start too soon? Uh, another one, I'll, I'll bite the bullet or I won't avoid it any longer. Um, it'll kill two birds with one stone. I have said that before. Instead of say that'll feed two birds with one scone. Okay, that's a little foo-foo, but okay. Um, what is the deadline instead of what's the due date? Uh, we have to pick our battles. How many parents have said that? Instead of we have to choose our opportunities. So that could be definitely in healthcare. Uh, can you shoot me an email or can you send me an email? Is Do you see some of our language? It's it's funny when it's brought to your attention. And instead of saying that was overkill, how about that was a bit excessive? Um, I bombed at the presentation. No, I didn't do my best. How about ju let's just roll with the punches. Let's just move forward. Okay. Or we can soften the blow by or we can make it a little easier by. I'm going to take a shot in the dark or I'm going to take a guess. Um, or how about that's not a bad idea? How about that's a good idea? And it's funny because this definitely turns into a positive. I send this to my daughter again, who most of you know is a high school teacher. And she's like, this is great. Let's not beat a dead horse. Oh, man, I say that to all the time. Let's not focus on that anymore. Um, just ch little changes here. I was blown away by her presentation <laughs> instead of I was impressed by her presentation. I was kicking around that idea. I was thinking um, through an idea. And lastly, he, he's a straight shooter in a meeting about how about he's pretty direct in meetings. So evolving from violent language, you know, instead of saying this, say that I just, I don't know, I, it just kind of resonated with me that because I know sometimes I will get not angry, but frustrated with a client or with somebody who I just don't feel is listening or understanding the concept. And it's funny, because I, I used to actually have terrible patients when I was younger, I'm much better now now. And so now I, I take the time to really look and say, what is somebody trying to ask me? What are they trying to say? Especially with my membership clients, because I love you guys. You know, our membership has grown now to over 100 members. And you know, where you can ask unlimited coding questions through email. And it's been great just having you 
you know, on board and uh, getting that contact and that daily dose of, uh, you know, what's going on in, in the billing and coding and reimbursement and compliance world. But I don't get frustrated with clients as much as I used to in, you know, and I shouldn't say in the beginning, but um, back in the day, only because now I really want to see what are you asking me? What is it that you're you're trying to glean from from my experience or from my insight as far as what you are, are saying? So I'll, I'll write something out if I'm frustrated and then I'll take a minute. I'll get up, I'll go get some iced tea, I'll do whatever, and then I'll come back to it and go, okay, I can't say that, that was mean. <laughs> and so then I'll soften the soften the touch to it and say something to the effect that I understand what you're saying, but here is my take on it or here is my interpretation instead of you can't do that. And think about that when we're talking to our providers. If you tell a provider right away when they ask a question, no, you can't do that, they will recoil and say, Why does that person work for me? I like to bring the positive before I bring, if there is negative, negative. So we talk to our providers when they ask and say, well, what my understanding of this is, and this is the interpretation of the published guidance. So here's what I would do instead, or let me research it for you. And then I will send you an email. I'll write it up so that we're both on the same page as far as how that works. Something that gives them an understanding that you're either a subject matter expert on it or that you do feel their um, concern or their pain, or you understand their question or their inquiry. And now you're using language that reflects that. So it's just important to, to give people the the benefit of the doubt that they're trying to get information from you to make things easier to understand, make it better. And you're there to help with that. And so I just thought this evolving language was, was kind of a a cool thing to see. And it it just makes you think. So I'm glad everyone, uh, I was able to actually put that out there. I hope that you find it helpful and send me a, a direct message and let me know if you liked it. Okay, well, I think that's it for me today. I know I've kind of drawn on a little bit today, but feel free to take a look at some of those things that I mentioned, my article on a couple of different sites uh, about the PHE ending, and then hopefully I'll see you either at the next uh, Medicare update, quarterly update in in March, or uh, we'll see you in April also for the conference. So everyone make it a great day, make it a great rest of your week, and thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing and compliance, including how to hire Terry. Follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. Music producer Assassin Music.